Friends, it's good to be back with you again on another uh, Thursday night Bible study and thank you for uh, taking time to tune in. And I'm sure many of you are looking forward to uh, the drive-ins again as they uh, recommence on 11 o'clock over there in the Lifeboat Car Park. If you're free, you're very welcome to come along and it'll be good to see you all again. Now tonight I'm not going to keep you too long. I just want you to turn with me if you have your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, well, later on maybe you'll be able to read them for yourself and we know that the Lord will, I'm sure, bless it uh, to you in your own uh, devotion. Three verses. And it's a little phrase that's found in each one of them. And then we're just going to share with you uh, what the Lord has laid in our own heart. Psalm 31 and verse 19 it says, the psalmist David speaking, he says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Then over into Psalm 86, please, in verse 13, in the psalmist David again speaking, and this is what he says, For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. And then finally over to the little book of Lamentations, just after Jeremiah and just before the book of Ezekiel, you'll come to the little a book of Lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And we know that the Lord will add us a blessing of his word to our hearts. I want to just for a moment or two tonight bring your attention to some aspects of the greatness of God. And it's a good exercise for you and I as the people of God in these days of uncertainty to have our minds upon the Lord, to think about his greatness. You know, everything about the Lord is great. He's great in authority. He's great in power. He's great in his majesty. He's great in his authority. Everything there is uh, about the Lord, everything that marks him is great. Now we read uh, each of these verses contain a little phrase, a little triplet of words. And it's the only three times that you'll find it in the Old Testament. And each time it is referring to the Lord himself. In Psalm 31 you'll find great is thy goodness. Then the psalmist David speaking in Psalm 86 he says great is thy mercy. And then away over in Lamentations Jeremiah the prophet speaking he said in chapter 3, he says, Great is thy faithfulness. And those are the three little aspects I just want to lift out for you tonight. And I'm sure that the Lord will bless them to you. And I've been enjoying them over this last uh, few days myself. How good and how great is thy goodness. That's what David said in Psalm 31. The goodness of God. And I'm sure you and I as believers, even in these days of isolation and difficulty and Days of uncertainty. Every one of us can testify that we have drawn from the goodness of God. Every day we have fresh supplies. We have fresh reserves of the goodness of God. You'll remember what the, uh, Paul said whenever he went to, to Rome. Or wrote the letter to the church at Rome. And in Romans chapter 2 he reminds them of the riches of his goodness. And he went on to say in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. That it was the goodness of God. That led us to repentance. The goodness of God. He's rich in goodness. You know that word rich there. Uh, means to be abundant in. To means to have reserves of. You know it doesn't impoverish the Lord. To be good to his people. The Lord is good. And he's rich in goodness. You remember in Exodus chapter 34. Whenever the Lord called Moses. Up onto the top of the mountain. Uh, and the Lord passed by and. Moses got a glimpse of the mighty attributes of God and it says and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the name of the Lord God abundant in goodness. The Lord is abundant in goodness. The greatness of his goodness, the riches of his goodness, the abundance of his goodness. You'll remember what David said in Psalm 86. He says, for thou Lord art good and ready to forgive. That's a lovely truth. For you and I as the people of God to enjoy. We can draw from the goodness of God. What about Psalm 34? The psalmist said. Oh taste and see. That the Lord is good. And that's the message that you and I. We, we ought to declare to the world. Men and women that are still in sin. Seeking to find their pleasure in the world. We can say to them. Oh taste and see for yourself. That the Lord. He's good. He's been good to me. 
and I'm sure he's been good and he's been good to you. Then of course in Psalm 23, uh, the young man David again as he, he penned that mighty psalm away out in the hillside of Judea, he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He says there's many things I'm not sure about, but this one thing I am sure about, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 52 and verse 1, he says, the goodness of God endureth continually. Isn't that a lovely truth? And even while we as believers can testify to the goodness of God, even the unsaved can testify to the goodness of God. And if you're listening to me and you're not saved, the goodness of God has been directed and showered upon you, even in your state of rebellion against him. You know, he's good to you in the life that he's given to you. He's, he's been good to you in the love that he's shown to you. He, he's good to you in the long suffering that he, he has towards you. The goodness of God. He's rich in goodness. He's abundant in goodness. And as the psalmist David reminds us here in Psalm 31, that he's great in goodness. Now there's many ways in which the goodness of God is manifested to you and I as his people. First of all, and I just want to leave these very simple thoughts with you. First of all, the goodness of God is seen in when he guides us. You know, the Lord guides us every day since we've got saved. He, he leads us. He guides us. He directs us in the, us in the decisions that we make. He, he directs us in where we should go and what we should say. He's the guide of our life. In fact, the word of God is described as a lamp onto your feet and as a light onto your path. The, the Lord himself, he said, I will guide thee with mine eye. And we can see as the Lord has guided us all in different paths along our life, ever since we've, got, we've been saved, the path in which he has led us has been good. He, he directs us along a good path. And so you can see the goodness of God is manifesting when he, he guides us. But then, of course, the goodness of God is manifesting when he guards us. You'll remember way back there in Genesis 15, whenever Abraham came from the battle and he had released his, his nephew Lot, uh, that the Lord came in Genesis 15 and verse 1 to Abraham. And this is what he said. He says, Abraham, fear not, for I am thy shield and thine exceeding great reward. That's how the goodness of God is seen, not only when he guides us, but he guards us. He guards us from the enemy. He guards us from the devil who would just seek to sift us like wheat. And we're so vulnerable and so susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. And yet he protects us. He guards us. And that's how you can see the goodness of God. He guards us on the road. He guards us with our health. He, he guards us even in our homes. He, he protects us and keeps us safe. He, he guards our spiritual health. As we seek to grow with the Lord, he, he guards us. But then there's a lovely way in which the Lord's goodness is seen and, and that is how he gives to us. The Lord's goodness is seen in how he gives to you and I as his people. You know, John's gospel is the gospel of the Lord Jesus giving. And in John's gospel, chapter 3, it's the great and mighty gospel text. John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that he, he gave. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the Father gave the best that he had for you and for me. But not only did the Father give him, give the Lord Jesus, but the Lord Jesus gave himself. Uh, because whenever Paul was writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul says, who gave himself for all. He gave himself for all. Uh, and that's lovely that you and I can meet people during the day, people that we don't even know. And we can put our arm on their shoulder and we can look into their eyes and we can say, God loves you. And Christ, he died for you. Because it says in the word of God, he gave himself for all. That's a, a universal picture. But then, of course, away back in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul writing to young Titus, he says, who gave himself for us. And that's not just universally now, but that's collectively. You know, whenever we get back into our assemblies again and we sit around the Lord's table and we worship the Lord Jesus for all that he has done, some brother may rise to his feet and begin to, to lead us in worship and he'll say, he'll say to the congregation there, 
Brothers and sisters, the Lord, he loved us and he gave himself for us. That's collectively. He not only gave himself for the world, that's universally. But he not only gave himself uh, for us, that's collectively. But then Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he gave himself for me. That's personally. And that's a lovely truth. That the Lord Jesus, he gave himself for me. You remember what the poet said, I read it down earlier on. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions and now I am free all because Jesus was wounded for me. He gave himself for the world. He gave himself for all universally. He gave himself for us collectively. He gave himself for me. Ah, that's personal. But not only did he give himself, he goes on and he gives us, he gives us life. You remember what the Lord Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 10. He says, I am come that ye may have life and that ye may have it more abundantly. So he gives us abundant life. But then in verse 28 of the same chapter in John's Gospel, chapter 10, he says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. He gave himself for us. He gives life to us. Life that's abundant. Life that's eternal. But then he gives peace. He gives peace. In John's Gospel chapter 14 the Lord Jesus says. My peace I give unto you. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Peace. He's the God of Peace. And that's why he can give us peace in the trial. Peace in the storm. Peace in the affliction. Peace in the dark days. Peace in the hard days. Because he gives not only himself. And not only does he give life. But he gives peace. My peace I give unto you. Unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But then he goes on and he gives us something else. He gives grace. He gives grace. You'll remember what the writer to the Hebrews said. He said, therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that ye may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Wasn't that the cry of the Apostle Paul uh, whenever he suffered with the thorn in the flesh? And he, he prayed three times that he would be delivered from the messenger of Satan. That came to buffet him. And the Lord answered him and said. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect. In weakness. My mind went today of that. A woman by the name of Annie Johnson Flint. And if you get a chance look her up. And find out a little bit about her. She was a woman that knew all about sickness. Uh, They tell us that she had to lie in bed. With at least eight or nine pillows every night. Just to make herself comfortable. She, She died I think as far as I remember with. With uh, cancer in the bowel. And she read a hymn. uh, Just before she died. And this is what she said. He giveth more grace. When the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength. When the labours increase. To added affliction. He addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials. He multiplies peace. When we have exhausted. Our store of endurance. When our strength fails. Ere the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known to men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. So you can see the goodness of God when he guides us. The goodness of God when he guards us. The goodness of God when he gives to us, he gave himself for us. He gives life to us. He gives peace to us. He gives grace to us. But then he's going to give a home to us. You remember what he said in John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Just for you he said. I'm going to give you a home. I was thinking of Joseph Hart. Whenever he penned that lovely poem. How good is the God we adore Our faithful, unchangeable friend. His love is as great as his power. And knows neither measure nor end. Great is thy goodness. Then we read over in Psalm 86 and verse 13. The psalmist David again speaking. He says, great is thy mercy. The mercy of God. Wasn't that the cry of our heart? The day that we could see it? 
Wasn't that the cry of our heart today that the Spirit of God came upon us uh, as sinners and he convicted us, convicted us of our sin and showed to us our state in the eyes of a holy God that we are sinners and rebels before him. We cried for mercy. That was the, the cry of the psalmist David in Psalm 51. He said, have mercy on me, O God. You remember the publican in Luke's Gospel chapter 18. And whenever he went into the temple and he couldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven. But he just smote his breast and he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you're not saved tonight, friends, that's what you need. You don't need money and you don't need a minister. You need mercy. And like the prophet of old to cry, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. That word mercy is the word pity. It's the word to have compassion. And it's interesting that seven times in the life of the Lord Jesus, you read about it in the gospel, seven different times, it says that he had compassion. Whenever he looked out over the multitude that were scattered as sheep without a shepherd, it says that he was moved with compassion. Well, whenever he saw the leper coming and kneeling to him, it says that he, he looked upon him with compassion. He, he, he had tender compassion. He had mercy in his heart for you and for I. You remember what Jeremiah said. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. The mercy of God. In Psalm 86, in this same chapter and in verse number 5, the psalmist David says that thou art plenteous. And mercy. You know there's great mercy. Because we were great sinners. There's mercy. Mercy at the cross for you. You know I was thinking of it today. There's mercy for us. But there was no mercy for him. Whenever the Lord Jesus was on the cross. Whenever he was surrounded with the bulls of Bashan. Whenever he was encompassed by the Roman soldiers. And while he was nailed to the Roman cross. And the Jews they... They shook their head at him and they, they stuck out the lip. And he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was, there was no mercy for him that he would have mercy for us. I think that's lovely. Mercy, the mercy of God. And the psalmist said here in Psalm 86, Great is thy mercy towards me, me the rebel, me the sinner. Lord, your mercy has been great. Is that, is that not the testimony of you and I tonight? The mercy of God. But then the psalmist goes on and says, Great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Isn't that a lovely picture of the mercy of God? Whenever he, he lifted us and preserves us from the wrath of God that was our due upon the Lamb of God was laid. The mercy of God. Great is thy mercy. You know, the poet put it like this, When all thy mercy, O oh my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view, I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. And yet it's a solemn thing to think of this, that there's coming a day when the mercy, the opportunity for mercy for sinners will be gone forever. Wasn't that the cry of the rich man in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16? Whenever he died and was buried and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. But there was no mercy. No mercy. There's coming a day for the ungodly. There's a coming a day for the unrepentant. There's coming a day for the sinner when mercy will be gone forever. Wasn't that the cry of David? Way back in Second Samuel 24 and verse 14. He said, let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hands of men. The mercy of the Lord. Great is thy good goodness. Great is thy mercy. But then finally we read in Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah said, great is thy faithfulness. And you know, you and I as the people of God, we're all the same. I was thinking of three characteristics that mark every one of us. First of all, we're marked by fearfulness. And in days of uncertainty, how many of us are marked by fearfulness? Afraid of the future. Afraid of what may happen to the family. And we're gripped by fearfulness. But then also we're, we're gripped by faithlessness. You know, so often we're gripped by doubt. And we don't have our faith in the Lord. 
Uh, we're, we're susceptible to being so faithless. But then, of course, we're all marked by fruitlessness, aren't we? We would love to be more fruitful for the Lord. We're, we're, we would love to bring more fruit uh, out of our lives. We would love to do more for the Lord. We would love to be more for him. And so you can see that we're marked by fearfulness and fruitlessness and faithlessness. Ah, but Jeremiah, he said here, he said the Lord's marked by his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. And we live in a world of unfaithfulness. Where, where friends are no longer faithful to their friend. Where husbands are no longer faithful to their wives. And wives are no longer faithful to their husbands. But this is what Paul said in Second Thess- Thessalonians chapter 3. He said the Lord is faithful. The Lord will always be faithful to his people. And great is his faithfulness. You know he's faithful to his plan. The plan of salvation. Way back before the hills and order stood, our earth received her frame. The Lord Jesus is described as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And yet God was faithful to his plan. He didn't abort the plan of salvation. He didn't, he didn't uh, object from it. He, he didn't turn from it. In fact, the Lord Jesus, it says that he set his face steadfastly to go toward Jerusalem and from the track he turned not back he was faithful to the plan and he's faithful to his people you and I as the people of God we are living testimonies to the Lord's faithfulness how he has been faithful to us every day he has never forsaken us he has never forgotten us and we could all sing like the lovely hymn we often used to sing it back in the lifeboat great is thy faithfulness O God my father there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been. Thou forever will be. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today. And bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousands beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. New mercies I see, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And I would just feel like shouting, hallelujah, what a saviour. You know, you can see the faithfulness of God in the plan of salvation. You can see the faithfulness of God uh, towards his people. But finally, you can see the faithfulness of God towards his promises. And maybe God has given you some promise for a family member and as yet they're not saved and you're holding on to the promise of God God is faithful to his promise for him maybe you're holding on to some promise concerning your ministry some promise concerning your family and you're holding on to that promise with all of your life well this is what the writer to the Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 he is faithful that promise he is faithful uh, you remember way back in Numbers Numbers 32 is it there. You, you read about the Lord. That the Lord is not a man that he should repent. Neither is he the son of man. It says hath he not said. And shall he not do it. And what God has promised. That's what he will do. You remember in Romans chapter 4. Whenever Paul was reminding the, the church there about Abraham. And how the Lord had promised Abraham a, a son. And it says that Abraham, he staggered not at the, the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And Abraham had his full confidence in the Lord that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. In other words, he was going to be faithful to the promise God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken and shall he not make it good? Ah friends, he's great in goodness. He's great in mercy. And he's great in faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. And these are just some lovely uh, simple meditations that you can think on. And think on for a few days yourself. And I'm sure 
you'll get many more and greater thoughts than what I have. But three lovely aspects. Great is thy goodness. Great is thy mercy. And great is thy faithfulness. And I trust the Lord will bless this simple word uh, to your heart. May the Lord bless you all in these days. Thank you. Amen.